God bless you. Thank you. Uh, I need to clear a couple of things up. Uh, well, let me get that off the screen. Got it. I need to clear, clear a couple of things up from last week. Um, before I clear that up, I need to say it's it's not easy to make up one's mind about what to speak on, unless it's a series um, that would, would suit uh, everyone best, I mean. Some of us like um, doctrinal issues. Some of us like uh, more uh, preaching proclamation uh, type things. Um, there's not um, and textual studies, that kind of thing. It's, it's not easy to make up your mind uh, what uh, what to say. Um, some people think the doctrine's quite a bore, and uh, there are times when one is tempted to think about. Well, uh, you've heard me talk about boring scriptures, hard to read, and you get fed up, and who wants to read it? And, how it all becomes, it's all nice and dramatic, but then it gets to be, you know, a bore, you know, on that. And uh, Josep Povice, as I've mentioned to you repeatedly, I'm sure, um, uh, helps how to read scripture. But I'm sure you'll hear more about that. But doctrine isn't boring uh, to me. I'm not saying it's boring to anyone. I'm just saying that under these sets of circumstances, we may be looking for something else, don't you see? And if if I'm starting and I need to clear up a few things doctrinally before going on, um, if it's uh, hard for you to hear, if you're not, if you're not a doctrinal, and that's not a criticism, I'm just saying you're not a doctrinal type and you want another kind, um, just be brave and stick it hard. It'll not last that long, okay? Um, last things I was saying as I was closing out last time we were together was um, I was talking about the Jews and how much we owe the Jewish people. And uh, um, I, I need, so as you know, uh, I want me to say it clearly. Let me say this clearly. No Jew can consciously reject Jesus Christ as the promised one, the coming one, the Messiah. No Jew can reject Jesus of Nazareth, who was the bringer of and the enactor of the new covenant. No Jew can reject him and be right with God. Is that clear? If a Jew wants to be right with God, he must embrace Jesus Christ as indeed the coming one. If Jews consciously reject Jesus and are looking for a Redeemer who is yet to come, they're waiting for something that's not going to happen. And he is going to come one of these days and be vindicated as the Lord of all and the one who uh, fulfills the promises that God made to Abraham. And all of those who wouldn't have him, who rejected the new covenant, 
who then hold on to the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, for Jews to hold on to the old covenant is to hold on to a covenant that condemns them. Jesus commended the world to bless humanity. The Jew first, you hear that expression repeatedly, and the Jew first because they were Abraham's physical children through Jacob, okay? He came and he came to take care of the Hebrew right of sins, the sins that were committed under the first covenant. If the Jew holds on to the first covenant and will not have Jesus Christ, who took care of the sin that the national sin uh, that was uh, committed under the first covenant, if they will not have him, he's the one that takes care of all the sins that were committed under the first covenant. So those who choose to reject Jesus, well, when judgment arrives, they will face their rejection entirely through the Mosaic covenant and then the one who came to deal with all the sin that they committed down those centuries. There's nothing good about that. There's nothing we could smile about in that. Yes. That's true and clear, but get this. We owe the Jews. We owe them our Bible from start to finish by the Spirit of God was brought to us through Jewish prophetic voices. Whether they lived up to what they brought us, God deals with that, but God still did it through them, we read a Jewish Bible inspired by the Spirit of God. And Paul will say this, and then I'm going to read some text from Romans. I need to do this. I need to do this. To be anti Semitic because they've been wicked and rejected Christ. All we're doing is adding on to them things that they don't need. They've got enough coming. But if the Spirit of God by Paul and Peter and Hebrew writer and all the rest of it makes it clear that we owe these people as the instruments of God to bring Jesus Christ to us, we need to acknowledge it unashamedly and thankfully. You can't say the name Jesus without speaking Jewish. Huh. Listen to this from Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 15 and verse 27. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it's got to be. I can't see. Uh, Romans chapter 15. He's talking about the money that's being sent from nations, non-Jews, being sent to the Jews to bless them. And now he tells us, what is it, 1527? If you know where it is, shout it out, will you? 
15. Yes, it is 27. Yeah, Romans 27. Yeah. 15. Romans 15. Make it 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He calls them saints. He doesn't mean that they are all saints, but there were Jews who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, were baptized into him in their thousands. That's the book of Acts. James will say to Paul, who was accused of insulting the Jewish uh, background and, and the things that God had gave, given to them. James tells him in 15, you've been accused of saying bad things about uh, Judaism at its best and the customs and that. What I'd like you to do, I would like you to pay the, the costs for these men who were having uh, their vows ended. And he said, you know, Brother Saul, how that there are thousands and thousands of Jews that have believed, but they still cling to the Mosaic style of life and this, that, and the other. James calls Paul to do that. Uh-huh. In 1525, Paul is going to the saints, the poor, uh, the minister to the saints. In 26, it has pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia, that's Macedonians and Greeks, of course, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. You and I have been made partakers of the truths of God that has come to us through Jewish prophets and Jewish believers down the years. The Hebrew writer will speak of faithful Jews who kept the faith, made it and kept it alive for us to this very day. Some of them women who would not give up their faith because they look for a better resurrection. And then in the book of Romans 11, I'm going to move on uh, from this after I say this, and I'll ask you for a response if you wish to make a response before I carry on. But I want to make this clear. I won't apologize. I won't. Nor should we as Christians apologize for the debt that we owe the Jewish nation. We ought to thank God for his use of them down the years. Okay? Uh, I'm in Romans 11. Romans 11. The Gentiles who were part of the Roman church the Gentiles who became part of the church in Rome had this notion that God had dumped the Jews because Jesus Christ was rejected by leadership and anybody that went along with him, because they had rejected him and because they had crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Gentiles were taking the view, we'll read this in a moment, Gentiles in Rome were taking the view that God was 
done with Jews. That's the end of them. And Paul said that's flat, not true. Chapter 11, verse 1. Um, yeah, that's 12, Jim. Let's make it chapter 11, will you? Chapter 11, verse 1 of Romans. I say then, has God cast away his people? That is, has he utterly abandoned them as he done with his people, the Jews? He says, I say then, no, uh, Jim 11, 1 for pity's sake. I'm having a bit of difficulty seeing. 11, 1. I say then, as God cast away his people, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite. If God had dumped the Jews, I would be out. And he said, others said that kind of thing, even Elijah. When Jezebel scared him spitless, and he ran all the way to Horeb and talked about to God abide it, and he said, I'm the only one who is faithful to you. And God said to him back then what Paul says to him right here in I am. 11.1 again, I say then, as God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left. That was Baal worshippers he was talking about, all right? They tore down this and the other. They said, and I'm the only one who is left. And they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? This is 11.4. God says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. And then he says, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. This is after the crucifixion of Christ. This is after all of that snarling and jeering by leadership, followed by the rank and file. He said there are still people, a remnant that I have saved unto myself. He didn't force anybody uh, to be Christians. God is not in the coercing business, but he worked with them and brought them to faith the way he brought you and me to faith. So, there's still hope for the Jew, and God has kept alive in the nation believers. Has he abandoned and said about the Jews, I want nothing more to do with them? That is garbage. It's not only garbage, it's contrary to the word of God. We're now in chapter 11 again. And in, in verse 18, well, let me make it 17. No, please, I'm sorry about this. 11.11. Um, 11. I say then, have they, the Jews, stumbled that they should fall and that be the end of them? Has, has that happened, he said? Certainly not. but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, 
salvation has come to the Gentiles. You know why you and I were called in? Because we were needed, uh, and we needed the forgiveness of sins. He called us in because we were in need. Paul wants to make the point here that he called Gentiles in so that he could draw Jews. They would look at Gentiles and see the blessing that the Messiah brings to them and make them jealous so that they want back in with God. When you, when you start thinking, and this is the trouble about having a nimble mind and going over and getting that a little bit and that little bit, and putting them all together and making it nice and long. To look at the cross of Christ and Christ himself and the resurrection of Christ and the glorification of Christ, it's filled with stuff. If we don't want to hear about it, we want to stay on the surface. If we want to be infants, if we want to do the, you know, that kind of stuff, well, okay. But there is truth missing. Truth missing that makes what you and I hold as faith not only true, but tiny. The truth is absolutely massive, cosmic, and not to bother with it. Well, especially I'm talking about people like me who talk, who get the chance to talk, to talk about bits and pieces and jumping here, there, and everywhere, and never open up scripture. If I do that, it's criminal. So every now and again, there must be grounds for doing some serious study in scripture. And you who love scripture need to be encouraged. And you, you who gather like this to hear scripture, for it not to be offered to you, I would be criminal. Yeah. Well, yeah, but people don't like doctrine. Keep up the kind of preaching we do, and they'll never, we'll never like it. We'll never know whether they like it or not, because they never get to hear it. Hmm? That's what that Dorothy Sayers said back when she was writing those detective stories. There's a biography of, of her. It's called A Careless Rage for Life. This was a wild woman that wanted to live. And she was absolutely wild about Jesus Christ. And she would hear and she wanted to get in. To it, she said, Let me tell you the God that is. He came into the world and what he put, let humans go through. He manned up and went through it himself. And she said, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing people saying, uh, well, Teachers, I mean, preachers, people don't like doctrine. She said, How would we ever know? You never teach any. You never preach, and this is a woman who rages about it. God bless her. I don't know if she ended up with Christ or not. All I know, I just want to believe that she did, because I know what she did when she wrote things like a man, a, a, a stage play, a man born to be king. These women and men who opened up the biblical witness for us, and gave their lives so that we can read our English Bible. If they didn't do it, I couldn't even read my Bible. I have no Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, or anything else. 
I just know that spending time in here, especially if I'm a talker, but then beyond that, even preachers need to go to church. Even preachers need to hear about God. Even preachers need to get in and, and be stunned by him. Hear these Jews. You know why Christ, God in Christ, uh, um, brought the Gentiles in? He says, to make Jews jealous. Do you believe that? It's the word of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, and we're still in chapter 11. I said I was going to finish this and then move on. I don't know if I'm going to get around to moving on. I'm, I'm taking longer than I thought. And 11, 11, they stumbled. What? That they should fall? Certainly not. Well, they fell, of course, like everybody did. But his point is, was that the end of them? Or was that the Jews dumped? No, he said, certainly not. But through their fall, the rejection of Jesus Christ, the not. But through their fall, um, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Jews. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, whew, you know how come you are rich in the gospel? I mean, leaving the obvious behind. Because the Jews stumbled. Jews chose to stumble. They rejected Christ and they crucified the one who needed, came to die, came to die. And they acted out of their own wickedness, but they fulfilled the will of God and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which led to his resurrection. His death was for atonement. His resurrection was for salvation. And the Jews, in their wickedness, they did that and were used of God. Hmm. Yeah. How do you like that? Huh? Spooky almost. But there's nothing strange about that, won't you say? A young man. Ended up 13 years in prison. 13 years. This is his mommy and his daddy. Wishes he was home. Instead, some woman put the move on him and he ended up getting thrown in prison. Okay. And then when he met up with the guys that did it to him, he said to them, You didn't bring me here. But that's exactly what they did do. He said, it wasn't you at all. It was God, the will and the wish and the purpose of God preceded what these thugs did to the young man. Okay? It was God that did it. So here's a fellow, he's got a spike and he's driving it into Christ's hands. And by and by, someone kicks a spear and kills. Here's the story of the biblical witness. In the very act, not after it, in the very act of him slaying Jesus, he was murdering while in his very, very act, God was sacrificing. While they were stealing life, God was offering and giving life. Not after the killing. During the killing and then the after, the whole thing. But here's a question, and I'm not developing it, and you'll think about it, and I'm half afraid to ask him, but it's on my mind. 
Did God murder Jesus? Did God murder Jesus? I don't want you to say anything right now. It's not this part of night, okay? I want to finish this in chapter 11. 11, 11. I speak to you Gentiles. 11, 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. I'm serving you Gentiles peculiarly, not exclusively, but peculiarly. I serve you. And so because that's true, and because I've got the blood marks and the brand marks and all of that, telling people that I'm serving you, the Gentiles. If I were serving Jews, they wouldn't be beating me up this way. I'm serving you Gentiles. And stop arguing with me. You can whip off his shirt. See all these brand marks? That's because I'm serving you. And because I'm serving you, listen, he says. 14. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, I want to save some of them. Uh, prove them who are my flesh. Now 15. For of their being cast away is the reconciling of the world. What will be their acceptance but our but life from the dead? They're being cast away. They're, they're, the nation has died in their sin. He said, if them being cast away is their death, what's a resurrection going to look like when they turn to God and Christ? Eh? You think that death deal was stunning? Watch what happens. And thousands Thousands turn to him, and there are Jews. There, are, uh, there, there's some bad uh, Jews for Jesus movements, but there are Jews for Jesus movements, and there, they are preaching the gospel. Yeah. Some, some of them are not doing well, but I, I still need to read this, okay? And, and and you need to hear me read it, so as you know that what I'm telling you about. God not having given up on the Jew and that, that you know it's biblical. It's not just an opinion. And we ought to be grateful that he won't give up on Abraham's children. He will not give up on Abraham's children. He will continue to offer and continues to offer and wants the Jews to turn to him. But they've done what all the nations of the world have done. They've gone after the flesh. They want to establish the kingdom with war and bombs and destroyers and this, that, and the other, as Gentiles do. And as Christians support that, Christians are doing the same thing. The church is folding the New Testament church is folding onto the same thing that the Jews did. We're in chapter 11 and in verse 15. If they're being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will be their acceptance but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off and you were grafted in among them and with them became partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember, that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Verse 20. 
Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? It doesn't matter whether we like it or not. It doesn't matter whether we like it or not. The olive tree out of which the New Testament church, the new covenant people grew, is Abrahamic, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers with whom God made a covenant. You will be a blessing to all the nations. And the two walked away from God again and again and again, and God punished them for it. They were cut off from the olive tree, the Abrahamic, the patriarchal olive tree, cut off because of their unbelief. Yes, but what if they turn? Oh, God be thrilled. God is thrilled, yet to men. And you and me? You and me? We'd be cast off also if we don't come in to the Lord. And then he says this in verse 25. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away on godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, the choosing, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God made promises to the Jew in Abraham. Abrahamic covenant is still being full filled. Yes? Well, but what is all this about all Israel will be saying? And that's what 11, 9 through 11 is all about. That's what the Jew was saying to Paul. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here, I'm not going to get where I hope that was going to go. I've got to finish this off, okay? I'll do my best and then well, you know, if you need to get up and leave, that'll be okay. I would understand. Here's Paul in Romans 9. We're not going anywhere. Well, you just spoke <laughs> for yourself there. <laughs> and I'm happy. Here, here, here's Romans 9, verse 1. I'll tell you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, 
my countrymen, according to the flesh. That's how he felt about the Jews that have rejected Jesus. That's how he felt about them. Yeah. And listen what he says, verse four. They are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption, the glory. That's the Shekinah where God manifests himself in the tabernacle and temple. Um, the uh, Israelites to whom the adoption, the glory, the covenants. That's the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jake, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant with David, the covenant with Aaron's family, all of those that God entered into with them. He said, this is Israel I'm talking about. This is the Israel that is currently rejecting Jesus Christ. You know what I wish he said? I would what what not George wishes wrong. He said, I would, I would be glad to lose my relationship with Christ if it would save some. That's what he says. Chapter 9. Uh, I'm in 9. Where is 9? Uh, yeah, okay. He said, he says in 9, 9, 5. He said, oh, make it four again, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God. That's the whole sacrificial system, the priesthood and all of that. Yeah? And, and the promises, the promises are Jewish. Of whom are the fathers? And from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Yeah. All of that, all of that, he says, belong to the Jew. And what? Um, and, and, uh, did, did I did I read that where he said he'd be glad to lose his life with Christ to save some? Yes, yes. Okay, I've read it. All right, okay. I'm, I'm uh, back down into chapter 11. Here's the story. God would see to it. No Israelite will be lost. All Israel will be saved. That's what the text says. That got at the Jew, and he had a good argument. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If all are going to be saved, then there's nobody has been lost so far. And there'll nobody be lost. And Paul will make it clear in chapter 9, verse 6. That's not true. That's not true. You don't understand who Israel is. Here's what he says in 9.6. They are not all of Israel. They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. Those who are descended from Jacob, whose name is Israel. Not every descendant of Jacob is an Israelite. <laughs> they are not all Israel that are of the physical Israel, neither because are they Abraham's seed, are they all children, is nine, six of following. Look, look. No Jew who had ever the faith of Abraham was ever lost. It's like saying no Christian. Whoever maintained faith in Jesus Christ was lost. It's not possible. Those who have the faith of Abraham are saved. Not everyone who descended from Jacob was a Jew. Bad, bad, the Jew says, but that's, that's a talking your way around it. This is all in chapter 9, and I can't see it, so I'm not going to read it. I'm going to tell you what's there, and you'll read it when you get good in time. 
He says in chapter nine, you, the problem with you Jews, you believe in the selection, election business. You believe in it. Look, if every child of Abraham physically gets the blessings, not only will Jews get them, who else will get them? Abraham had more than one son. He had Ishmael. All the Muslims then would be in because they've got his flesh. All the Edomites, the Esau group, Esau, the older brother of Jacob, he was Abraham's son. In fact, he was the son that Abraham wanted. God, oh, that Ishmael might walk before thee. And God said, nope. Isaac, it ends. So the Jew was happy that God looked at Abraham's children and chose between. He had Isaac, didn't want Ishmael. He wanted Jacob, he didn't want Esau. He said, you people, you Jewish people who have rejected the Lord, you believe in election. It's all the way through the Old Testament. But when it gets down to God choosing between Jew and Jew, you want to drop it. He said, you can't do that. For the same God who chose between Isaac and Ishmael, between Jacob and Esau, chooses between Jew and Jew. They're not all Israel that are Israel after the flesh. And Jesus said that in John chapter 8. He said, I know you're Abraham's children. According to the flesh you are. He said, but in truth, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the things Abraham did. You would believe. But no, you're wanting to kill me. This Abraham wouldn't have done. So 9 through 11, what is 9 through 11 about? It's about this. That God loves the human family. And he loves the Jews. And he loves the Jews now as much as he loves Gentiles. He loves the Jews as much as he loves the Irish, the American, the German, the Russian, the whoever. But a real Jew is one with Abraham's faith. The others are not really Abraham's children, except according to the flesh. And listen to this, the last thing, uh, I don't know. Well, it bless me, it's nearly time. Here, here, here's something to listen, uh, to think about. The Hebrew writer, says that God made a covenant under Moses. He mediated it with the Jews, the physical descendants of Abraham through Jacob, not the physical Abraham children through Ishmael, not to the Edomites, no. God made a covenant with Abraham's children through Jacob. He didn't make a covenant with the Edomites. Obadiah opens up saying this. Jacob have I loved. Edom have I hated. Which is medicine text. Not as harsh as it sounds, but I'm not interested in looking there right now. I'm wanting to say that God made a covenant with Abraham and his children, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac through Jacob, where the 
people that God made the first covenant with. Hebrew writer says, God made a covenant with him. He said, I'm going to make a new one. This is Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, where God speaks to wicked Israelites. They're in captivity. The bulk of them and the rest are going. Jeremiah 31, behold, it has come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and brought them up out of Egypt, which covenant they broke. Now, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. He will make a new covenant. Now, when he says, he goes on to say in Jeremiah and in Hebrews. Now, when he says a new covenant, he makes the first one old. What's old is getting ready to move out. And then he moves out the old covenant and he brings in the new covenant. But who? Here's the question. See, I think I think some of us is irritating some of the others. Maybe, maybe it's not. I'm hoping everybody, oh, let's go, you know, uh, not, not the, the truth of me, not probably the truth of it. Believe it. Don't be afraid of anything the Bible says. Don't be afraid of it. He said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That new covenant is called, in the book of Hebrews, it's called the new covenant, and it's called the second covenant. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. Here's the question. Did God make a new covenant with non-Jews? Did God make a new covenant with non-Jews? Did he make a second covenant with non-Jews? He did not make a new or a second covenant with us. He made a new and second covenant with Israel, who has Abraham's faith and believes in Jesus Christ. And what happens? We are invited then into their new covenant. We owe the Jew. And he says what we read in 11, he said, you belong to a wild olive tree. And you know what happened to you? You were cut down and you were grafted into a cultivated olive tree that has the root of Abrahamic, Isaac, Jacob covenant of promise belong to the Jews. God, what's it all about? He's telling the whole Jewish world. He's telling the whole Jewish world back then and today. I want you. I want you. I want to bless you. I made a new covenant in him. See, look at him, that young carpenter fella. I made a new covenant with him. I established one and I offer it to you. You don't lose when you come to me in him. When you, if you were to come to him, and me and him, you would be getting your own blessings that I have purposed for you. And I've never changed my mind about wanting the Savior. So he's telling the chairs, you know, God is such a faithful one. 
and he prophesied, he speaks about the Messiah coming. But you know, as the passage we read said, a deliverer will come out of Israel, not out of Gentiles. The Redeemer will come out of Israel. Ah. He said, I want to give you the blessings that I have promised. All you have to do, just come to me. And he, him, as Hebrews 8, 6 and following, he, it's in him I establish a new covenant with better promises. The whole book of Hebrews says, what came under Moses was absolutely marvelous. What comes under the new covenant is so much better. Moses was faithful in his, his house. Oh, marvelous man. In my view, the most marvelous man apart from the marvelous one. He was faithful and great. He said, but Jesus as a son over his own house. He's the son of the house. Uh -huh. Jews need to be told, if you ever meet a Jew, if you ever meet a Jew, tell him, tell him how God loves him. Even if he's a thug, like a lot of us Gentiles are thugs, just to tell him, God loves you. Because you did what you did back then, you're your people, I mean. Uh, and because the people hate you and all the rest of it, God, um, God in Christ loves you. And not a one of you who trusts himself to me in Christ, not a one will be lost. You're indestructible. Because once you come to me and remain with me, I take you in my hand, and nobody can pluck you out of my hand. My father is greater than everybody, and nobody is able to pluck you out of heads. Tell the Jews, of course, tell the Gentiles, tell the Gentiles. But I think we tell Gentiles. A lot. But if you ever talk to a Jew, I talked to a Jew one time on an airplane. Oh, a lot of years ago. He was a rabbi. He was heading back to London. And he's all, you know, it's all geared up. And uh, I wish I'd known how to go about it. I didn't know very well how to do it. I said, are, are you a teacher in Israel? He said, no, I'm a, I'm a rabbi in London. I said, are you? I said, what do you teach? He said, well, I you know, teach the Tanakh. I, I, I teach the uh, Holy Scriptures. I said, no, you teach Daniel? He said, yeah. I said, what do, what, what do, you, what do you do with that uh, prophecy that God would set up the kingdom and the dads of the four empires? Of course, that's nowhere on the for it too. He said, that's a, that's a difficult section. I said, well, yeah, yeah, it, it's a difficult section. But what do you do with them when you get there? He said, uh, that, uh, that, that's, a, that's a difficult section. What I'm telling you is true. I'm not embellishing. This is what happened. I, I remember it vividly. I said, well, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's a tough old text. But, but when, when, you, when you get to it, what do, what do you say? He said, you, you've read a lot about our faith. I said, well, yeah, I know. But that was the end of the conversation. He, he said to the lady, can I have my meal? And then he got his kosher meal. That was the end of it. But if you're ever talking to a chill, don't put him, like I, as I did, put him in trouble and give him a couple of texts that are really hard for him. Just, just, just tell him, God loves you. Loves your people. Loves your people. And loves your people because that's who he is and that's how he is. 
And God repeatedly was saying to the prophets, for a little while, I was angry at you, but only for a moment. He said, I drew you back to myself. I was had wrath for a minute, but I love you with an everlasting love. Yeah. We owe the Jew. The Jew is loved by God. And we ought every now and again. Thank God for it. Um, well, well, oh, my time's way well, well. So let, let me say this last thing, this last thing, and then I'm done. His wife, a young wife, late, maybe late 20s, took up ballet and loved it and worked and worked and worked and worked. And of course, you know, pain limbs, joints, all of that stuff, you know? <laughs> and he's massaging her and he's so sympathetic and got the oil light and he's doing the number on her calves and all that and her re ankles and, and her back and all of that. And he says to her, you're working really, really hard. She's saying, I know, tell me about it. And he says, is it worth while, and she said something really marvelous. She said, you know, when you love something this much, you never even ask questions like that. You don't even think it, you just go for it. <laughs> you just go for it. You know what happens to people like you? Do you know what happens to people like you? <laughs> after a while, after years, you know, if somebody said to you, uh, is, is serving him worth it? And you say oh, something like, I don't know, I never think about it. <laughs> uh, when you love, when you love this it's way, and this much, you never ever think of such questions. You just go for it. You just go for it. And when they ask Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, how does it come you run across half the Greco-Roman world, leaving a pint of blood in every street where they chase you down? How does that happen? And he said, well, when you love, <laughs> you don't have any choice. You don't even want a choice. You don't even think upon it. God bless you. Thank you for your patience.